Well, we are continuing our series through Ephesians, and tonight we're going to be in chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles handy, please turn there and follow along with me tonight as we study. But as you're doing that, I want to remind us of where we've been through this study and think about the overall picture of what's happening in this letter. Paul divides this, it seems, in two sections. The first three chapters deal with uh, the doctrinal issues that surround our being in Christ and being children of God. And, and the last three chapters deal with the practical realities, those responses that are before us as followers of Jesus. This is how we live. So the first half is all about what God has done for us in Christ, and now the latter half that we're getting into tonight deals with our response to what God has done for us in Christ. And so Paul's saying this is the way you need to live as followers of Jesus. And so there's a lot of uh, doctrinal realities that we see in the first three chapters, but he begins chapter one by sharing with us uh, the understanding that in Christ we have adoption, we have redemption, we have confirmation. And, and not only that, but that Christ is the head over all things. And then in chapter 2, uh, we see that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but God made us alive with Christ. He raised us up with Christ, and He seated us with Christ. And what a blessing that is. And finally, in, in chapter 2, we come to understand that we've been brought near uh, by, by the blood of Christ, once we were far off, once we were uh, alienated, we were far away, but now we've been brought near, and God has broken down all of those barriers that divided humanity, and He's ushered in for us the spirit of unity. And so that leads on into chapter 3, where Paul explains that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. No longer are they separated, alienated, strangers, hopeless, without God. But now, because of Christ and in Christ, they've been brought near. And Paul, there in the latter portion of chapter 3, offers this prayer on behalf of those in Ephesus. And he prays that they be strengthened through the Spirit that they be indwelt with Christ, that they be rooted and grounded in love, and that they be able to grasp the fullest dimensions of Christ's love, and that they would be able to come to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And so we see this prayer being offered uh, by Paul in chapter 3 and the doxology that comes at the end of chapter 3. It's verses 20 and 21. And there within this doxology... Paul acknowledges that with God there are no limitations. And he says that God can do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think. And that leads into then chapter 4. And that's where I want to begin tonight. Let's read the first three verses of, of Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, as Paul begins this chapter, he identifies himself as a prisoner. Now, this is the very same way that he opens up chapter 3 for us, identifying himself as a prisoner. Now, this is very literal, that Paul is under house arrest when he's writing this. So this word prisoner is very literal for him. And then he goes on to speak about this calling that we have. Now, uh, as you think about it, he's urging them to walk in a manner that's worthy of this calling to which they've been called. Same goes for us as well. He's calling us to, to recognize this uh, call that we have from God and to, to walk in a worthy way. Now, the word calling, uh, some of the older versions do not use the word calling, but rather they would use the word vocation. But vocation has come to mean uh, something that we choose. But calling is something to which we are chosen or something through which or for which we are chosen. It's important to remember that church means the called out ones. And so Paul is urging them to understand that they've been called to live a different life in Christ. 
And so he's urging them to walk in a manner that's worthy. Now, this word worthy comes from the Greek word axios. And axios uh, has the root idea of weight. Now, it's not W-A-I-T, but it's W-E-I-G-H-T, weight. It's where we get our word axiom, which means to be of equal weight. And so when you think in terms of walking worthy or in a manner worthy of the calling, think about times where we think about a person who uh, maybe is held in high regard. And so we're going to follow after them. And we say those are some pretty big shoes to fill. Well, this is the very same kind of thing, the idea of a heavy weight. If you have this individual that you're following, someone that uh, is, has been held in high regard and you're going to follow them, well, we would say those are big shoes to fill. And essentially what Paul is saying is if you're following Christ, Christ has some pretty big shoes to fill. And you need to walk in a manner that's worthy, that's of equal weight. And so this idea of weight comes into the pressure that is placed upon us, and, and maybe pressure is not the exact word, but the concept of having this uh, pressure, maybe an internal pressure uh, upon us, feeling as though we need to live a life that honors God, that follows in the footsteps of Jesus, and make sure that we're walking in a manner that's worthy of the calling that we've been called. And so uh, it's important to think about the aspects or the characteristics that he gives for this worthy life. Uh, he, he gives several of them here, humility, gentleness, patience, he says, bearing with one another in love. Now, when Paul says bearing with one another in love, what he's really saying is putting up with each other in love. Uh, and then unity. Now, unity, again, uh, we've seen it elsewhere in this letter already, and it's going to continue on through this letter. I think it's, it serves as kind of a sub-theme to this idea of being in Christ. And so unity has a couple of aspects with it in this particular passage, that this unity is given by the Holy Spirit to those who are in Christ. And not only that, but there's this element that is given to us to where we are to maintain or to keep this unity. And so we have this responsibility to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called to do so with humility, with gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love and having unity and understanding that unity is something that comes from the Spirit and that we all have this responsibility to maintain this unity. And so then let's move on to verses 4 through 6. Here he says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this passage is known as the seven ones. And those seven ones are the body, which is most likely the church, the spirit, which is most likely the Holy Spirit, there's one hope, that is the eternal hope of eternal life that we have in Christ. There's one Lord, which certainly cannot be mistaken as representing Christ. There's one faith where we put our trust and our, uh, our reliance, our belief uh, system is all based in Christ, in God, what God has done for us in Christ. There's one baptism, and this, uh, this is something that must be mandated uh, across the board of humanity. That this is for all. There's one baptism, one God and Father. And he goes on further to talk about God. He says he's the Father of all. He is, he is over all. He's through all. He's in all. He's everywhere. And so these are the seven ones that Paul talks about. And it's interesting to me that as you think through these ones, this one passage, it, it comes right on the heels of verse 3 where he talks about unity and how we're to maintain this unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I, I believe that verses 4 through 6 is an extension of Paul's statement in verse 3 regarding this unity, that he's illustrating that, that, that the life that we live in Christ is, is enveloped in one. 
And so he lists these seven ones. I don't think it's a coincidence that there are seven ones. Seven, as you know, is the perfect number, the complete number. And Paul is saying this is what it means to be unified. Think about the foundation that we have, the unity that exists among the Godhead. Then let's look at verse 7, and we'll go all the way down to verse 16. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together uh, uh, by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now certainly this is a familiar passage to us and we see this passage coming on the heels of what Paul has discussed regarding this unity. And so the unity of which Paul has written is also characterized by great diversity. And so Paul's concern for unity is balanced by an emphasis on diversity and our responsibility that we have as followers of Christ. You see, Paul has written elsewhere regarding diversity of gifts. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, also in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. And Paul is explaining that Christ won a mighty triumph. But he used this triumph, this victory, to give gifts to people, not to extract gifts from them. And so we see verse 8, this quote coming from Psalm 68, verse 18, where he says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, interestingly enough, the Hebrew text and the Greek translation of the Old Testament both have... You ascended, you led, and you received gifts rather than he. Now, Paul, through the inspiration of the Spirit, he altered this quote to reference Christ and what Christ has done for us. It's Jesus who has won the victory. And unlike earthly victors who take the spoils for themselves, Christ doesn't take gifts from people, but rather he gives gifts to people. And so we see this coming out. And then the, the parenthetical statement that we see in verses 9 and 10, this is Paul's interpretation of this passage from Psalm 68. It seems that there are differing opinions regarding what this passage actually means. Paul is giving his understanding and through inspiration of the Spirit, the proper understanding. But still there are questions that are raised by uh, scholars and commentators today to exactly what Paul is referring here. The most probable understanding of what Paul is explaining in verses 9 and 10 is the incarnation of Christ. Uh, some would believe that this has something to do with, uh, with Christ giving the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Others would say this might have something to do with Christ working through the church, which uh, is hinted at to what Paul, in, in what Paul says in Ephesians 2 and verse 17. Uh, but I believe that this is referencing Christ coming in the flesh. Uh, 
Uh, this is his incarnation, that he descended from uh, his position in heaven. Elsewhere, Paul talks about this. Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul speaks about the mind that we are to have. It's the mind of Christ who humbled himself, uh, who took on flesh, became a servant. He's talking about the incarnation. I think that's what he's getting at here, is that Christ came. And through his coming, there's a victory that's won. And rather than him taking all of everyone else's gifts, Christ gives gifts in his victory. And so then verse 11 comes where Paul lists these various gifts, these areas of giftedness which come in Christ. And so the question that would be raised would be this. What's the purpose of Christ's gifts? Well, Paul answers that. It's to serve Christ's people uh, so that the body itself might become increasingly unified in faith and mature in practice. That's what the gifts are for, so that we can continue to grow closer to one another, to be unified as a body, and so that we can mature, and so that we can be who God has called us to be, mature in our practice as followers of Jesus. And so uh, the purpose of God for his church is seen in this latter portion of this section, verses 14 down through verse 16. The, the purpose of God for his church is that it might become full grown and that each of its members might contribute to this maturity by becoming spiritual adults. It's not enough just to say that we believe. It's not enough just to put Christ on in baptism. But there's growth that must continue to take place. If we're the same today that we were the day that we were baptized, then something's wrong in our spiritual maturity. Paul is uh, urging us to realize what God has done for us through these gifts that Christ has bestowed upon us. And recognize that the calling is that we be unified in an ever-increasing way. And that through that, we would grow and mature into spiritual adults so that we can serve properly in our areas of giftedness. And when we serve properly together, in the very same way that our bodies function, uh, every joint and ligament functions in just the right way, in, in, in the way that that our bodies work, that's the way that the spiritual body is to work. And unless we are working properly, there's going to be dysfunction. There are going to be issues. And so what Paul is calling us to is to understand that in Christ, we've been given these gifts and God expects us to put them to use so that each member of this body would function properly and contribute to that maturity of the overall body of Christ and therefore func function properly and build itself up in love, he says in verse 16. Now, if we continue reading verse 17 and following down through verse 24. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity." But that's not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." Now, what Paul does in this section is that he sets up against one another the present world system and what encompasses the Christian life. Verses 17 down through 19 is the reality of uh, this present world system where the Gentiles are uh, walking about in the futility of their minds. Their, their understanding is darkened. Uh, they're alienated from the life of God. And Paul says... Don't walk in that way anymore. But verse 20 is where he brings in the Christian life. He says, 
don't walk in that way anymore. But in Christ, in this newness, you need to make sure that you put off the old self, that you renew your mind, and that you put on the new self. Uh, this section is very clear what Paul is saying. Listen, you have to understand the change that must take, take place in your life. When you put Christ on, you're putting on a new self. You, you no longer need to clothe yourself with the old manner of life, your manner of living and functioning and interacting with people, but rather renew your mind and put on the new self. Paul would say in Romans chapter 12 that we need to be renewed in our minds to, to, to live in a way that uh, is appropriate to one who is a follower of Christ. We need to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, which is our reasonable service. We need to make sure that we're understanding that as a follower of Jesus, my life must be different from what it was prior to my putting Christ on. And so we put off the old self, we renew our minds, and we put on the new self, which is crafted or created in the likeness of God in true holiness, righteousness, making sure that we are bringing honor to God in the way that we live. That's the call here. And so then, uh, verses 25 and following, Paul gives five specific examples of this higher standard of the Christian life. Listen to what Paul says, beginning at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And so, this is Paul helping us to see these higher standards of living that we are called to as followers of Jesus. And so, he says, Speak truth. Control your anger. Quit stealing. Start working. Control your tongue. Recognize that the words that you say impact the people around you and speak in such a way that's going to build people up, not tear people down. And make sure that you get rid of all of these things. He lists them here. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. Get rid of all of those things and put on the kind of attitude, the kind of life that Jesus exemplified. I would go all the way back to the very beginning of this particular chapter in verse 2 where he talks about humility, gentleness, patience, love, bearing with one another in love, and making sure that we live a unified life with our brothers and sisters. And so this is the calling that we've been given. And Paul says, here's the higher standard to which you're called. Make sure that you live this way. Put off the old self. Renew your mind, put on the new self, and live in such a way that brings honor to God. Certainly, we think about these last three things that he mentions in this chapter, verse 32, as being very important. When he says, put off or put away these things in verse 31, verse 32, he says, be kind, be tender hearted. Tender hearted means. Uh, is really another way of saying be compassionate. Think about other people. Think about what they're going through. Be tender-hearted toward others. And make sure that you forgive, recognizing that God has forgiven you. I think there are great lessons to learn from this particular chapter, and certainly Paul has laid out for us as he opens up this second section, uh, this last section of this letter uh, as he opens it, he says, here's the way you need to live. He begins in the first three chapters by saying, here's what God has done for you in Christ. And so now that you're in Christ, in these last three chapters, 
Here's the way you need to live. Make sure that you're living a life of humility and gentleness and patience. Make sure that your life is filled with love. Make sure that you bear with people uh, who are struggling. Make sure that you stand unified with your brothers and sisters. Be kind, be tenderhearted and compassionate, and make sure you forgive. God has done a remarkable work in Christ. His redemptive work for us is beyond measure. And he's calling us to live a life that shows other people who he is. And so the question for all of us, am I doing that today? Am I living a life of humility and gentleness and patience and love? Am I striving for unity uh, through peace? Am I being kind to other people? Am I being compassionate? Am I forgiving? Let's challenge ourselves to be who God has called us to be.